Hi everyone, welcome to Mobile DevOps is a Thing, a podcast by Bitrise, showcasing developers from all around the world. Our special guest today is Mariano Sorisha, a Google developer expert and tech lead at Venmo. In this episode, we're going to talk about fintech, building apps in Flutter, and his journey from a small town in Argentina to working in Silicon Valley. My name is Nora Bezi, and I'm here today with Mate Benedek. Hey Mate, nice to see you. Hey all. Thanks for coming. And our guest, Mariano, nice to meet you. How's it going, Nora? Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you all, and thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's going to be a super interesting episode. So let's get started. What's something that we should all know about you? I didn't start from a software background. I was doing something completely different. I was at the beginning doing customer care. And I decided that I like, for whatever reasons, uh, smartphones. When no one knew what a smartphone was like 11 years ago. Yes, right. It's almost 11 years ago when I started coding. I didn't code at the beginning because I was really bad at it. Um, <laughs> but at least I have this thing that I was like, oh, it's, it's really interesting. I was finding fasc- uh, like fascination of what the things you can do with limitations. Back in the day, a uh, smartphone wasn't this huge images with huge processors. They barely can run an app. And so the ability for you do something big or something important in such a small device for me just grab my attention. And that's why kind of like shifted a little bit to software. But again, knowing nothing about it, I started getting some books and stuff. It was hard to get information because YouTube was barely a thing as well back then. So you don't get the tutorials and all the stuff that you get right now. So I start like slowly moving into my own projects and I'm getting my own clients until I then shift into companies. So yeah, it was like 11 years in the run. I started as a junior developer and now I'm a tech lead. I'm a Google developer expert. So for me, again, it's something that I never thought that was going to happen. I was raised in a really small city where I was the only one coding from a 20,000 like population, a small town to be working for Silicon Valley. So it's like a, it feels like an entire life of doing a lot of stuff and happen a lot of stuff in coding, but actually I feel really proud of all the other role that I take. Oh, wow. First of all, congratulations for becoming a Google developer expert. That's such a big deal, especially as you said, coming from a small town in Argentina and now working in Silicon Valley. I think that's the kind of story that people always want to hear. I'm sure it will inspire a lot of people. And uh, now you're working at Venmo, right? I'm working for Venmo PayPal, which is one of the biggest companies. And Venmo is pretty much one of the biggest, if not the biggest, fintech in entire US. And I'm from Argentina. So again, I got the language in my disadvantage because my main language is Spanish. And then I have to learn English. I have to learn software developer. I have to learn a lot of skills in order to work for a huge fintech because it's not like you say, oh, I have one year experience. And you're going to be contract from anywhere around the globe. It's a matter of time of experience and knowledge until you reach those points. But you really feel good when you reach those points and you say, okay, I really did a really good uh, professional run in my life. And what are those points that, that you mentioned? Or what are those milestones that you're most proud of or that you're most happy to share with the listeners? I would say at the beginning, making that shift of something completely different into software, that's not an easy thing to do because a lot of people are scared to do those huge changes in their lives. Uh, the second one was shifting from doing my own products and clients to start going to big companies. I will, the first one was, um, it's called Ethermax. It's a huge gaming company who pretty much battle hand in hand with Zynga in terms of amount of users and amount of income and stuff. It's almost a unicorn here in Argentina. It's only one of the few unicorns in Argentina. And working for a company like that, it just opened my mind of the things and possibilities that you can do with apps. Because uh, Trivia Crack, which is their biggest game, is actually done fully native on Android. It doesn't have any Unity or any program at all. So doing a lot of memory management for a small Android devices, it was a challenge. And then, I will say the next one was doing the shift into U.S. companies, doing the uh, remotely and start working for San Francisco that I happened to work for Zynga as well. So it become for a circle. I start with a competition, I ended up with the other one. Uh, (laughs) 
And then, yeah, I, I, I been live in San Francisco for a while. So I think all those big changes show like how much I improve over time. And I managed to make like, I would say like the software equivalent for Hollywood is going to Silicon Valley to be with all the huge companies are and just be there and make it if you want to call it. Oh, that's a really good analogy. I've never thought about it that way, but it really is the Hollywood of software development. It's funny. So what's your favorite part about working there? I would say the mention, the skill of what you do and the impact of adding a new feature will impact on the users because it's not like in a small app that you work for a startup and you just fix bugs and stuff and that's it. And maybe people will get better feedback and stuff. Venmo has almost 60 million active users, which is it's one out of five of every U.S. American. So that's a lot of people. So everything you do, every new feature you do, it impacts one out of five and every person that it downloads that app. So for me, it happens that I go from work or back when I was like taking Ubers and stuff and people say, like, what you work for? And I would say, I work for Venmo. And they will tell me, oh, I love Venmo. You help me a lot. It's like, I can give money to my kids that are like far away, like in different city or they're in college and I can send them money and it makes you feel nice. Like, wow, I'm making a huge impact on people, making their life easier just by moving money from one point to the other, but in a different fashion because them is really unique in this thing of, it's almost kind of like a social media where you send money, which is different from any other competition that we have. So that I think that makes Venmo unique in terms of fintech in, t- in general. Venmo is pretty well known in the US and most people are familiar with it. But uh, for people living in other parts of the world, could you just give us a quick overview of the app and its main functionalities? Because you're also responsible for the functionalities and new features, right? Yes, we do some specific, the, the team is huge. We got a lot of of course, new features and stuff that like every company always have and plan in advance to see which one works, which one don't. But I think the main thing about and differential for Bemo is when you start at the beginning, now, now we make a change in the UI. A lot of people, if they update the app, they notice a little bit more. But at the beginning, when you download the app, it was like, what is this a social media? I thought that was an app like a fintech to send money. And it was a little bit confusing. Uh, but as soon as you log in, you realize that you have three tabs. One is your feed, your friend's feed, and the entire planet feed. You can only see the transactions that you made to someone else. You can see the comments and you can see likes and transaction comments, but not the amount of money, which at the beginning, I don't know how they thought about that, but every transaction needs a comment, no matter what. It could be an emoji, it could be a small text, it doesn't matter, but you need a message to put there. But if you think about it, it's really amazing for like big data, for example, you can quickly analyze if someone is doing money laundry because of the different messages that they're sending, you can end up analyzing. It's like, oh, this is something sneaky. They're, they're doing something weird. And you can just block those accounts. Or if you realize that the users are not using for the intent that you wanted, for example, you, at the beginning, Bemo was more like someone goes to dinner one pays with a credit card and everyone split the money with Venmo. So it's easy to do it. But what happened is, for example, in my case, my personal trainer, I pay with him with Venmo. And what if the company, after analyzing all those comments, like, hey, we're losing a market that we didn't know that we have. Because all these comments apparently is people taking out your dogs or babysitting or doing all those stuff. And that's why now we have this product which is called the business profile when you can actually create a more business friendly, when you can you know, do all your taxes and stuff and people can easily recognize your brand and have all those transactions right there. Because when you pay someone at the beginning, it's like, is this guy legit or not? But if you see a lot of people, a lot of comments, it's different from any other. Because you know, you, you can go to different e-commerce when you see all five stars, but you don't know if those are fake. You don't know if those are well, like actual buy or not five stars. On Venmo, no, you need to do a transaction in order to leave a comment. So if someone, you get into their profile, you see a lot of comments, like really good comments, like, thank you for this, thank you for that, blah, 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 and so on. Behind that, that you cannot see is the transaction. But at least you can see that that person is legit. What they offer in a service or not is really good. So it's a good way. It's like, it has a lot of stuff. It's not just, oh, kind of like a social media where you see where your friends are, like, buy, I don't know, the movie ticket. 
it could actually be a lot more, like in this case, expand into businesses. Considering all the regulations that a finance app needs to comply with, how is the development process different? Is it more challenging? I don't know if uh, more challenging will be the my answer, because I will say in some points are easier than average, because once you get the feature, that means that it went through tons of approvals in order for you to get and actually code something. Because if you start coding and then you request an approval, yes, it will be a challenge because it will be a lot of back and forth with the different politics and privacy and all those stuff. Because it was like, no, you cannot do this. No, you cannot do that. So once we get a feature, that means that a lot of people from legal say, okay, this has a green light. That means that you can start doing it. So in that point, I would say it's like, okay, they clear all the edges. They say, okay, this is something that we can actually do. But yeah, it has a lot of regulation, of course. Everything we do, every message that we left could impact on the company because uh, let's just say you have a small fee, but that fee is not readable. Users can actually sue you because you didn't put specifically what that fee was about. So if they send money to uh, someone that they don't know and they wanted to retract and say, no, but we have a small message that is say that if you wrongly send money to someone else, you cannot request that money back. And they say, it's like, I don't see that. It wasn't visible enough. I can just sue you and get the money back and even more money. So all these things needs to be considered that you don't consider normally like in any, most average apps. But in FinTech, those things are really, really important. You're handling money from someone else. So you really need to take care of that. So you would say it's much more about, in, about the planning. That, that's what makes the difference. So like planning all those features. That's where you see the real difference compared to some other sectors? Yes. Planning takes a good portion every quarter. So we really plan something. And when it's planned, it's already leveled down to us as engineers to know it's like, this is what you need to do. And if something is approval, maybe sometimes that feature gets stopped until get all the correct approvals uh, from privacy, from legal, from everywhere necessary until it reaches to us and says, okay, this is breaking down into sprints breaking down into all the UI and, and, and different features and you can start coding it. And then we just ramp up whatever we can use Firebase or different services that people know how to ramp up, like do an A-B testing and all those stuff to make sure that we got a good user adoption or if we don't have any crashes on different stuff. So we make sure that once it's there, we test the waters and we go around, but because we're so big, no matter if we try to test the waters, we're still going to break into the news. It was like, oh, Bemba did this and Bemba did that. And it was like, oh, okay. And then you need to ramp up sometimes a little faster now, but you need to take care that that doesn't break our, our business. So it's like that, I would say that at least not in the part of engineers, but in the part of legal and the part of like product, it is a lot, of, I would say a lot more pressure than a regular app because you had all those factors, the outside factors of the company. Everyone put the eyes on you. Yeah, I think it's especially complicated in the U.S. because there are some state-specific regulations and these fintech apps often require licensing and registration with different state regulators. But I guess this is also more of a concern during the planning phase, right? So not really on the engineering side. It doesn't touch our engineering side, but we do have like a specific stuff more like now that we also moving into business, now they need to do the taxes. Because in the past, you send to an individual, not an issue. You don't have to request any information. If you send to the bank again, the bank is the one dealing to know that that person is actually legit and you don't do that. But once you make like a wallet, if you want to call it, and you can actually hold the money and move the money around, that's when you start like tipping your toes into bank regulations. That's what a lot of like fintechs try to be more like a handover and not really be a wallet. Because as soon as you become a wallet, you start becoming, oh, you're more like a bank than just a regular money round. And those are the things that they need to really analyze, like how much this is going to cost, how much this is going to impact us and blah, 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 and so on and so on. So I always say it, it always ended up to legal, but it also, of course, affects the features that we do. So we ended up putting more options. If it's business, now we, they need to export the taxes and all the stuff so they can do 
from the IRS, from the all the taxes regulations from the US and different stuff for the users to easily know that the money that they have is legit. So we need to request government ID and all this information so that in the past, when you just hang over money, you don't do it because the bank will do it. They have all your information. We don't know. We just hang over money. But when you become more like a wallet or like a proper fintech bank, then it's when you need to request a lot of personal information from the user because you need to know if that money is not going to end up in money laundry or different actions. You've mentioned that there's a lot of work and planning going into getting green light for new features. My question is, where do these new features come from? Do you try to be responsive to user feedback? What's your best practice on this? Again, it doesn't touch too much the engineer side, but we do have like a or point of response like, hey, do you see the competition? Do you see what they're doing? Do you see they're doing really well at this stuff and we are not doing it? Why? So we get a lot of stuff we get from the user feedbacks using the app because a lot of transactions happen. If they complain about something, we really not about those complaints because we have a, a place when they can file a, a new complaint and they say it's like, my app crashed at this point or this feature is really annoying or what is so difficult to send money or something like that, that it could happen and we need to take those things and improve. That's why we improve the UI because now it's super simple. As soon as you open the app, you got a huge button that it says pay your request. In the past, you got like a those almost plus sign floating buttons that some apps have, but the user does really know that that button is for requesting money or pay? They don't know. Sometimes if they don't see the, the word pay request, they don't know. They're like maybe intrigued about that button, but they don't know. So all those feedbacks from are from user feedbacks. And the other ones in terms of, I would say more feature-like and those features that can actually increase the income of the company are more competition-based and how see how the trend of the, uh, the entire like ecosystem is around us. Because... Maybe you're fine. Maybe you're P2P and that's it. You just send money through peers and that's it. But if you see there's a business size, then you start becoming a P2B or B2B or B2B and all those stuff. But the competition maybe is really strong in those points. And then you need to know how do I get to those markets like this B2B or this P2B. But in a way that people find it good for us to use Venmo or not to use any other name of the competition and what will decide to go with us. So we really need to analyze our competition and ecosystem to see what are the good things that they did, how we can make a twist and improve or the things that they really did it kind of bad. So we don't copy those things. So at least we analyze that they did the mistake and we don't do that mistake, but because it's a challenge enough, always pushing who goes first and stuff. And it's always, someone is going to make mistakes sometimes. So it's better if you catch them fast and don't affect the company. So you've mentioned speed is a key factor in fintech, which is exactly what we found in our recent report on finance and banking. The frequency of app releases tend to correlate well with an app being successful. But when you're talking about speed, what do you mean exactly? Is it the number of new features released over a period of time? or more like the time it takes to fix bugs? In general, fixing bugs are maybe even better in terms of times as other companies. For example, if you're, if you're making a game, fixing a bug is super critical because that affects a huge amount of income. If it's a really like what we call most company call a PC or like something that is urgent, it doesn't matter the company, it's always something that it needs to be like a hot fix. It needs to be right there outside. But it's something more like a, small UI related or something like that. And the users are kind of used to, we make sure that we really, really fix it and it looks good until we release it. So that things normally takes time. It's not an issue. Features sometimes are the ones who are yes, being pushed, but because they're being pushed by the competition. So if the competition goes around, they push something that we wanted to push and they're like four, three, four, 10 months, a year without feature. And we don't have it. We just lose a lot of market. But if we ended up releasing almost at the same time or just a week uh, difference or something like that, we still have a chance to show them, hey, our feature is good as well, or it's even better. But yeah, I would say that in terms of speed, it will be more like a feature so they can really impact and improve the user experience 
and all those stuff. The box and stuff is not really something, unless it's something super urgent. If not, it's not. Real. How does it translate to the everyday life uh, of engineers? We I mean, really have a break it down in terms of spring. So I would say then in mostly startups, they don't really have, even if they, they say that, oh yeah, we have all the agile thing, you get new features and tasks by the, uh, I would say by the hour, by the day maybe, it's just like, oh, now you need to do this. Now you need to do that. In our case, we know by a quarter in advance. So it's like, you're going to build this feature, which you need to break it down in all these sprints. And that's how it's going to be done. So when you get there every single week or every two weeks, depending how a company do their sprints, you already know which features and stuff you need to do, which is great. It's like, it gives you a lot of time in advance and you can do analysis in advance because if you're almost midway and you see how the thing is going, you still have this mid quarter to say, oh, we can still fix this because until the point that the engineers are going to start coding that part, we're going to tweak it to make it better. So I was saying that point, there's a lot of analysis being done more than any other companies that I work. So you manage a team that consists of both mobile engineers and backend server side engineers. Correct. Uh, yes. So it's more like a product focused approach instead of a project focused one. Is there something especially challenging about this? Now everyone is remote. So communication yeah. is the key. It's, it's key because if you don't if you can't see their faces if you don't know if they're in the office it will be a challenge if you're in the office you see them every day you can chat quickly that's it but if you are remote communication is key so if you're i don't know you're sick or if something happened or if you have an issue and you don't raise your hand and say in chat hey i need this i need this review i need this stuff we don't know what happened we don't know what happened thousands of kilometers away from us so i will say communication 100% 100% key in that part. We got daily standups, so we are always know what we're doing, if we got any blockers or something. But again, because our sprints are planned with so much time in advance, we got pre-plannings. So we kind of know, again, even before this, the actual planning, the things that we are going to do. So when we get to the planning, it's pretty much like, yeah, I do this, this, and blah, blah, blah. Or if someone feels more comfortable, say, I will take this ticket and this one will take this other ticket. So again, a lot of planning being done in advance in order for us to make our lives easier. Of course, everyone wants that, but also because we can actually deliver because you point into a version and say, okay, I say that I'm going to deliver this for this version. I'm going to do it because I committed to that. So there's a lot of commitment in in the features they're going to build and they really paid off when you get to those points and you really deliver in time or, or you're even over deliver. And you say, wow, this it really ended up really well. But if it wasn't because of that planning, I don't think that will, will be the case. Okay, so at Venmo, you develop native applications, right? That's correct. And another big part of your professional experience is Flutter. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about Flutter. Obviously, one of the main advantages is that you can release apps simultaneously to iOS and Android and web with full feature parity, but other than that, what do you think, what makes Flutter so special? I discovered uh, almost when Flutter became visible for everyone, which is, people don't know, but Flutter has almost six years, but internally was called Sky. It was a different name. It was an internal product that the Google used it for their, I think they use it for, I can't remember if it was um, AdWords or a similar product that they use it. They tried it to, pretty much compete with um, with JavaScript when they code the language start, but it ended up being something internal until they realized like, oh, this has actual potential and a way to enter the market. They decided they, they were going to battle with using Android and iOS, which the competition, uh, you name it, React, React Native and PhoneGap, Cordova, all those apps only battle, if you want to say mobile because they really want to battle the native development to make it just one code base and you deliver it. I think that was the premise of why Android and iOS was really pushed at the beginning for Flutter and then evolve into being web, desktop, and all those stuff. But they really need to be good at something at, at the beginning so people can use it. I started coding Flutter in 2018 with what was called the release preview number one, which was June 2018. 
which what the code was a little bit more stable. You can actually get production apps even if it wasn't production ready and became production ready on December of 2018. Because I'm part of the different uh, Google developer communities, we need to teach people about Flutter. So that pushed me a little bit more about like, okay, what is this Flutter thing about? I need to make examples for different people so they can show in the events and I can show them that they can easily quick and code apps. At the beginning, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was hard and, or easy. It was w- different of the way you, you code native because you, this declarative UI for people who don't know, I would say that declarative UI is almost like you're, if your UI is set on a stone. You just cry your UI in, in a giant widget tree. There's like return, return, return. You got like everything big and they interact with different variables. In difference, in native, you can have these objects normally because they're object oriented and you can have a, a text view and you can have an image view, but you can move that object around anywhere you want it. You can hide it, you can remove it, you can add it and change different qualities from that thing. This one is in the widget tree. It's right there. You can do some stuff similar to that, having builders and stuff so you can get widgets from one side and put it in, in a different side, but it's almost set in stone. So it took me, I think, like two weeks to code a small app out of knowing nothing about Dart, out of knowing nothing about Flutter, which was shocking because I, the ones that I tried to get Koro and PhoneGap in the, the past, I was really confused how the flow was because they have little small details that it wasn't Android and iOS that you just download the IDE, download the, the emulator, run, library, you're good to go. Web has this small stuff that you make sure that CSS has this version, if the HTML this, if the JavaScript that, if you're using Vue, if you're using blah, blah, and so on. Like small little details and frameworks and stuff that you can keep adding and adding and adding and adding. That for mobile developers, sometimes it's like, whoa, this is really confusing. Uh, but for web developers, it's everyday life. That's what uh, web developers go easy with React Native because they're just in the same boat. They just use JavaScript or with all the goodies that they have, they can go with React Native because that's the most intelligent approach. But if you're more like an iOS, Android developer, even in backends, I noticed a lot of backends who are, were afraid to do mobile development with Dart because they really feel comfortable about it and they start just coding on Flutter. So that's, I start finding passion about Flutter and then I went to the Google I.O., and I saw the, the amazing stuff that could be done because it could, I feel like it's a lot more like a unity for apps because they really render like super fast with a lot of graphics. You can put them huge images with a lot of animations and nothing happened. And if you try to do the same in Android, you will get an out of memory because it cannot handle that much memory because it's working on a, on a virtual machine. But in this case, it's working all native, it's called all GPU thing. And it's then drawing on the UI. So then you can start making games out of Flutter. I even make a small game out of Flutter. And, and I see people there, with, I think it was last week, they, they made a small game that they run on, into an Android TV and they did it with a remote control, controlling an app, full game done on Flutter. I was like, whoa, you can do a lot of stuff, not just apps, you can do a lot of stuff. And the fact that you can have it on web and desktop, that's another advantage. So I would say that it's growing so fast from 2018 to now, even if you check um, what is called the, I think it's called Octoverse or something like that, the GitHub every year releases which projects are the, the ones like trending the most. In 2018, Flutter wasn't even in the radar and in 2019 was number three. So out of nowhere. Yeah, we do a state of app development research every single year. And I think the number of Flutter use cases in 2019 had a significant increase. So by the end of 2020, they could reach or exceed React Native projects. So it's really popular. I've read about the hot reloads in Flutter. So you change something in the code, click a button and immediately see what it would look like in the app. Is this something that only exists in Flutter? It exists in a lot of uh, different frames. For example, uh, React, React Native and all those stuff because they have like what is called just-in-time uh, compilation. They can, everything making changes that you do, what they do is like they inject the code and you easily make the changes. Instead of native, what happens on native is they need to compile the code because it's a compiler code. Then it send the, all the new bytes and stuff. They install the app again and it runs. 
Android try to do something like hold reload, but it breaks a lot of times if you run a few times or it takes like a couple of seconds. I would say like a four or five seconds until you make a small UI change. If you start making code changes, then you do need to send it again, which is, that's one of the reasons why Flutter, when you grind UI is so fast in comparison to Android, because in Android, you need to go to the XML, do all the changes, change the color, run again, wait two, three minutes. Oh, it actually changed the color. You're like, I wait three minutes for just changing the color button. That's not really inspiring for UI. But in Flutter, it's like, as soon as I'm writing and changing and doing stuff, every time that I hit the common S to reload, that's it. I see the changes because it takes less than a second. It takes it only, I think it's like 300 milliseconds. So you really don't notice while you're typing common, as soon as you see the, the whatever, phone emulator, the, the change is already there. So even if you make business logic changes, you'll see there right there. So in terms of how fast you can go in development, it's amazing how fast you can go with development. You can spend more time of making your app look good than make it work because it's going to work. But you can also now have the plus of make it look really good because you have this all this time that you didn't have in the past to make it look good. That sounds amazing. It really makes me want to learn Dart and Flutter. I'm converting a lot of people into Flutter, which is really <laughs> yeah. tense. Yeah, <laughs> I got yeah, a yeah. lot of iOS developers and stuff. I do a lot of clones and stuff that we're going to maybe talk later. But a lot of people say, like, whoa, I didn't know that Flutter could do that. And it's like, yeah, you can do it. And they're like, I'm maybe going to start. And I try to help them. It's like, hey, it's a snippet for you. Just give it a try. And everyone's like, just hook on Flutter and just like, yeah, I love it. Yeah, you're doing a great job. I'm convinced. <laughs> you talked about that, um, that you're teaching a lot of people um, how to use Flutter and uh, how to code in Dart. Usually when we, um, when we talk with um, developers, an interesting thing that while they are teaching others, they are learning a lot themselves. So for you, what, what are the m most important learnings by, by teaching? It didn't start with Flutter because at the beginning, out of nowhere, I, was, uh, I didn't have a job, of, I would say like six years ago that I left a company. I thought that I was going to find another one really fast and I didn't. And I ended up in a, in a coding teaching uh, company. So it was the first for me. And I told them, I'm not a teacher. I don't I have no idea how to teach. But I was like, oh, but we need someone who is strong in Android. Okay, I will give it a try. And I was there for three months until they actually find a professional teacher. And sadly, I had to go. But it was, again, it was a try. And I was sad to let me let go. But at least I start something. And then an actual... It's not a college, it's more like a community college, something smaller. And they told me, oh, someone left for the Android teaching classes. It's just two hours a, a week. Can you do it? And I say, okay, I don't have a college degree. Uh, I don't know if that's legal, <laughs> but I can do it. And oh my God, everyone was between 19 and 21. And if you think kids are screaming loud, Teenagers and young adults are exactly the same. <laughs> so I was almost their age because I was like 20, I think it was 27. So the difference gap was like maybe five years, but I still feel like their mom. But I have to put them on, guys, just don't scream. <laughs> Pay attention uh, all the time. But at the, at the same time, every time that I teach something in a good way to them and I show them something really cool, because normally what I see from teachers is like they have their curriculum, they do that, and that's it. And I push a little bit more. For example, in my case on Android, what I did is I created an app for them, open source, that they have all the curriculum, but the code done for that app includes all the details of the curriculum. So if, technically, if they download that app, they wouldn't know what we were going to do for the year. And they didn't know. I tell them, it's like, if you download the app and you see all the curriculums, this go was done with all the curriculum, which is awesome for them. And they were like, whoa. And you ended up like, I don't know, you being a little bit protective for them. It's like, they confess you a lot of stuff. It's like, oh, I'm looking for a job and maybe you can help me and all those stuff. And I don't know, it's, it, it teaches you a lot of stuff and a lot of skills. And it really teaches you how to make slides for events and stuff, because you have to do it all the time for your students. <laughs> so if you really want to be a good speaker, try to be a teacher, 
trust me, that's hard mode. Being a speaker is more easy than dealing with teenagers. <laughs> Those are hard mode. Uh, so if you can do really good slides with that and you can really put your like mind across how to level it down the information for a teenager to understand, that means that you can level it down for everyone. So if someone goes to an actual conference, they already have the knowledge. And if you put into a level that everyone can understand, that makes your life easier. That means if you want to be a speaker, that's way easier. So being part of the Flutter and be part of like this, try to convince people into moving to Flutter or being an expert and all those stuff, all those skills in advance, if you teach to someone, it's a huge advance for you. It's like, it makes it so simple. Does it help you to become a better manager? Yes. <laughs> Yes, because you, you start getting a lot of passions, like, okay, I need, to, I need to, don't get angry about this stuff, like, they need to have you deal with a lot of people, because in my class, at that point, I got like 20 people that you need to know that if someone was sick, and someone needs to go, and you need an exam, and some students will tell you, teacher, I didn't study for this exam, and you get mad, it's like, why you didn't? <laughs> I teach you so much and you fail me. So it kind of in the works, you say, it's like, oh, I got a ticket, uh, boss. I'm not getting to a ticket. It's not the same, but it's almost equivalent. It's like, why you didn't do it? And you need to help them and fix the stuff. So I would say it's like, they're not the same, but they're really similar. Uh, so I, it makes you, it makes you a leader and try to help them and not to be their boss. Just like pointing your finger and say like, why well, you didn't do that stuff. It's like, no, you, you need to help them. You're there to make their life easier your life as a leader should be hotter and worse because you you got a lot of pressure you need to help a lot of people when in the past when you're a developer you try to do your best and people will help you and stuff and you only have one task when you're a leader you have managers you got products you got all your employees and you got a timelines and all the stuff if a developer doesn't get to the timeline it's not their issue if they didn't get it because it was really hard but you you tell your bosses or your managers that you're going to deliver that one so the all the blame and all the stuff ended up in the leader so it's a lot more pressure but you still at the end of the day if you did a really good work you really feel good so even through sales, like, why would you want to be a manager if your life is in hell every single day? Because it feels really good when you do a good job <laughs> and people count on you. And having that thing is like going to you, it's like, thank you for this. Thank you for that. I was like, it's the same with the teachers. Like, thank you for teaching me this. Thank you. I reached a, a new job because of you and all those stuff. It's that gratification that you get every single day. And it's like, okay, it works every single headache that I have. So it's worth it. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that, um, being a manager myself. And also for, for your case, we talked a bit about managing mobile and web, web engineers as well. So what do you think what are the main differences between developing web applications and mobile applications? In our everyday job, we don't have that because it's full native and, and we got back in. So it's not really an issue. But in the ones that I have, I wasn't really acting as a manager. I was part of the team that they have that kind of thing. So... I always noted how split the thing was because Android and iOS and a lot of stuff are really similar. You got this like, almost the same CI CD pipeline. You got the almost same release phases because you can release once a week or once every two weeks. Or if you're like a huge company like Facebook and stuff, you can release every single second, like a new version into the web and all the stuff. And web has their own pipeline. They have their own approach. They need to compile and they have their different stage dev and all these environments that for mobile are really standardized that you need to really write it on your different setups and your ide in order to do that and web because the ides are not what there wasn't made for the platforms like android studio is for android xcode is for ios web you can do whatever you want you want to grab a notepad and you want to code at that you can do it but if you want to then use like maybe intellij or things like that to improve all like VS code is super popular for web developers nowadays. They start like leveling to make it more, I would say mobile environment to say it's like, Hey, this is cool. You can have all your Git and all the stuff in one place and you can change branches and all the stuff that the mobile developers enjoy for so long. And the web feel like a mess, 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 mess that is trying to make it more into, okay, more manageable. So that thing I would say that mobile and web 
was always split into teams. So web team was really cut themselves alone into a lot of stuff. And because you're not going to do the same almost 100% features on web than mobile, again, features are not the same. So teams are ended up cutting a lot. Unless you are something close to like, I say, a social media, which things need to match a lot. Like Twitter, they really need to match mobile and web. But fintechs and stuff, they're really different because fintechs, if they're mobile first, everything is going to be in the app. And in the web, you will have help and you will have information and different all the stuff. Like maybe if you release something new, you get the, the homepage with all the information about that new product and all the stuff that you don't have in the mobile. Because in the mobile, you want the quick interaction for the user to make the, the transaction. And that's it. That's all they needed from the mobile. And on the web, no, people just go to surf to see what's new, what changed it and all the stuff. It's just different approach. That's one of the main factors of why web and mobile are still split in terms of stuff. And also depend on the products, of course. Mobile development and web development are quite different. For example, mobile platforms are more fragmented, obviously, and there are also different tools and processes. In your experience, does mobile need a different set of DevOps practices or would you just approach it the same way you would approach web development? At least what I see when they really split, uh, like the mobile, and more if it's, like I say, mobile first and they're really focused. For example, when I was working on Singa, we were work with friends too. And we have a huge CD, the kind of competition, the biggest one, the most complex one to do with that it has like this major with a towel here that is really complex in order to set up that kind of uh, CI. But you can run like a massive amount of like different machines at the same time that we can just hit it harder and, and it run. And when you're going to a startup, it's like, ah, that's really complex. Let's go with someone easier that when it comes like people like you, like BitRise, that is plug and play pretty much. You say, okay, which brand you want and which project you want. And when you push, you make a bill. That's it. We did the, the job for you. So I would say that huge companies, they normally have this huge form of testing devices and blah, 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 and so on and so on. And they have really standardized the things that they wanted to do. So the bigger the company, I would say that depending the agreement that they, they become in which service they're going to use. Are they going to use a Clashion? Are they going to use G Suite? Are they going to use Microsoft 360? It depends of the agreement those companies reach with these other huge companies. I would say the startups have that privilege of, yeah, I can pick whatever I want or the cheaper that I want. <laughs> you mentioned that you use uh, testing devices. What about the rest of your test coverage? Like unit tests and UI tests. What kind of other test automation best practices do you have? We do a lot of stuff in that case. We do, while coding, we do a couple runs to see if what we did in our emulator and devices run. Then we do uh, all the unit and UI testings in our devices as well, in our machines as well. And then every time we hit the, the CDCI, we got a form of devices that are going to run on AWS with a lot of devices to make sure that it runs on different sizes and all the stuff and all the UI should be working as expected. So it's constant. Every time you hit a new PR, everything runs out, all the UI test runs to make sure that if a new feature went out, you didn't bring something old. So with all those regressions needs to be considered because you say, oh, I add this, but did it break something? You don't know because that normally is not your task for, for when you're a coder. That's when you have QA that it makes all these regressions and see if your new thing didn't break all stuff. QA also makes a manual like a run, like a small test and all this different stuff. But we also have all this farming. So I would say we got like a one, two, three, like four or five hands touching the, the app and making sure that nothing breaks. And on top of that, A-B testing. And on top of that, crashing analytics and all those stuff. I understand you have a very sophisticated system in place when it comes to uh, testing yep. UI tests and regressions. But do you also define, and if so, how do you define the optimal release strategy when it comes to features or when it comes to smaller fixes or, or some, some minor edits? The things that we really focus on that is a strong, strong focus, we really need to have at least a minimum of 80% of code coverage in everything we do. 
So if a new feature goes out, part of the presenter, part of like the business logic, they really need to be tested. If it doesn't go through a minimum of that percentage, the CI pipeline is not going to approve your PR because you need all these approvals. We have like 10 to 15 approvals before a human approval is set on. So if you pass all those approvals, doing all the unit testing, all the UI testing, then becomes ready for a, a human to see the code and see, okay, makes logic, passes all the tests. I mean, it's a good thing. So we really put that bar really on top. And also it depends on the app because if you're a small app that it maybe shows, I don't know, download wallpapers and stuff. If you have a small glitch in a button and stuff, it's not a deal breaker. But when you handle money or you're in a company that uses a lot of money, like, I don't know, a game that uses a lot of coins and stuff, one of those breaks can cost the company half a million, two million, 10 million a day. And you don't make that money a day as a developer. So <laughs> that's going to be an issue for the company if that happens. So nothing can break on production. And if it does break on production, you got a flag that you can turn off that feature really quick. So no one has that bad experience. So everything you release a new feature on, it has a flag that you, we can easily turn it on and off. Just to make sure that even if through 10 eyes went okay, but it's still phones are phones and anything can happen, uh, still breaks, we still have a flag to say, okay, let's stop this, what happened? We can fix it, push a new release, and then turn it on again and see what happens. That's what we do with small 1% release, just to make sure to test the waters. And do you use any monitoring tools to check how the app performs on your user's phone? Any... At least in our case, no so much. I would say more like in any cases like we're with friends, we do because we need to hold like really all Android devices and handling a lot of images and animations happen at the same time. In our case, it's just pretty much text and buttons. That's all we do have. It's nothing really fancy. And I think that's one of the things that maybe fintechs have an advantage is. It's just a list of transactions, text, and buttons, and that's the whole thing. Yeah. I don't think nothing of that slows down as an application. If you go more like a game kind of thing or gamification kind of thing on an app, yes, you really need to test this stuff. Animations go through, if, if they have sound, if they match the sound and the animation, and so on and so on. And then you really need to focus on memory. When I was working on Singa, memory thing was a huge thing that we need to check in the memory, the consumption of every single thing. And if they were consuming a lot of RAM for small devices, we need to choose a different resolution for the images or remove the animation altogether if it was the case for a really old phone. In our case, it's just a lot of text and buttons. That's it. Nothing that it could affect memory at all. So I won't say we really pay strong attention memory stuff because if we see that we have a good level of complexity and it goes well, that's it. I think the most weird thing challenging is when you upload an image because a user can upload a, I don't know, 20 megapixel image and you need to compress the image, push it to the server, or sometimes push that image to the server, but you're not going to push 10 megabytes image to the server because that could take years if you're in like a 2, 3G network. So you need to do that process first, make sure you compress the image, send it to the server, and then return the even more compressed image maybe. Because again, you're watching in maybe a five inch display and from those five inches, the image is a small thumbnail. So why you're gonna use a 20 megapixel image? Maybe you need just a, I don't know, three, yeah, 320 by 320 image and that's fair enough. At a JPG uh, compressed image. When we ask you about mobile DevOps, if it means something for you, usually how we define it is we define it in uh, quote unquote, a uh, holy trinity of, uh, of three things, uh, process, tools, and culture. Briefly uh, talked, I mean, we briefly talked about the tools, like the CI, CD platforms, some of the processes, so like have very high test coverage and have yes. uh, uh, automated test running for every PR yeah. running. Mm -hmm. But do you have uh, any, any other, when it comes to processes or culture? We do have a weekly release. So we need to make sure that once we wheel a feature, we need to know what's going to go to that release. So some features and stuff in PRs are having a higher priority for that one. But we always make sure that, again, it has between 10 to 15 uh, tests to run before human, human review. Then we got two human reviews that it needs to give a green light in order to that PR to pass. Once it passed, 
then we send it to QA just to make sure that it makes a regression all those stuff. And once they do all the regression, then we do a release cut with that release cut. It's going to have again another regression and then a lot of testing and then it will end it up for users' hands with a small, again, tweak pointing out and going a little bit from a small percentage until they reach the 100% and everyone has the new version. So it has like a really, really structurized process between you push a code, CICD, and human hands, human looks, another cut, test and regression again, and so on and so on. And that happens every single week. And when it comes to the culture, how do you help developers uh, do their jobs best? Or are there any values that you value the most that helps you be successful? I think there's a lot of uh, ownership and to make them feel comfortable to over deliver. Because some companies like pushing time. It's like, no, you need to finish this now and then blah, 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 and so on. And through all these uh, different times that we're living right now, stress is already a factor for a lot of people. Uh, burnout is a lot of factor for a lot of people. So we have a culture of no, no. If you need to relax, if you need to eat, if you need to stop, because sometimes people when they work remote and they're not used to, they realize like, oh, it's 5 p.m. and I didn't eat. And you need to eat to work and to make your brain work. So we really focus on just if you, it's 1 p.m. if you have a meeting but you need to eat, go eat. That's the important thing right there. The, the meeting can now be recorded thanks to all the, the things online. And then you can see the re recording of the meeting. And if you got a question, we can do async. You can just send just the question and get the response back. So let's say that this is what you're going to deliver. Owner that thing. Make sure that it works and makes sense. If you have any issues or you start getting burned out, we can kick this thing. We can talk with someone say, hey, can we kick this feature one week extra? Because it's really burning all my developers. And in order to everyone feel better. And they really sometimes like, I don't know, they send us gift as, I don't know, breakfast sometimes because we did a great job or, or they send us more swag and stuff. And people say, like, well, we get this recognition. It's just like, when you're online, you don't know if someone is actually seeing your work. But when you get those recognitions, like, yeah, they're, they're watching us. Like, but in a good way, right? Like if we did a good job, it was like, hey, this is a recognition for you. Even if it was your work and it's your work and you have to do it, when you put your passion on it, they, they show it. Like they display it of, yeah, you, you did a good job. You feel like alone in your house, like I did it. I did it. <laughs> yeah, that does make a really big difference. So besides more and more DevOps practices and agile approaches, automation, and Flutter potentially taking over. What do you think, what's in it uh, for the future of mobile development? What trends do you see coming? I think in the past year, I thought that a lot. Because when I started developing apps 11 years ago, when I say that I code apps, I don't think anyone understands what that means. I think they understand one of those like TV commercials that you can send, I don't know, a joke to 2020 and you will receive jokes and games into your phone. I think people thought that I was working in those kind of stuff. And it was like so hard to explain. And it's like, no, do you see that your phone has a calculator? Yes. Well, someone did that calculator. I'm one of those. And we were like, okay, how do you make money? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It was like so weird to explain. It's like, okay, I guess so. Um, which was a lot easier if you tell them I'm a lawyer and they're like, oh yeah, sure. But if you explain back then what was the coding, no one knows. Like it wasn't this, it wasn't even like Google making apps and stuff. Even Google was researching how to make apps and stuff. So explaining that was already hard enough back then. And you didn't have this CI CDs. Uh, people will just update apps and maybe they will lose their keys if they didn't save it and github and git glove wasn't really a thing that people were looking into sharing they were using all systems they were not the best to to pass all the information you need to do everything with terminal and then you realize okay this thing started getting more and more professional i would say like six seven years ago like companies really start putting their focus on the old ways of doing software into mobile how to do it better and then becomes more professional. I would say nowadays, if someone wants to code apps, 
it wasn't like 10 years ago that you can make a, again, a calculator, put a $1 and they will become rich. That's no longer the case. Now you need to provide something to the user. You need to provide a service because that service will, will keep getting a flow into your company of uh, money and stuff. Even games, it, you, they shift from being paid games at the beginning on iOS that you pay five, $10 for each. And now they're free to play, but because they have ads, and they have uh, in-app purchases, and they actually gain more money than if it were cost five or 10 bucks. Because they realize that if we make this more like a service than an actual product, then maybe we can get a lot more money. It's like product became more for hardware based. If you're hardware based, yes, you can charge them a base fee for the, the product and that's it. But on top of that, sometimes it's like, okay, but I can give you the app and if you pay $10 a month or whatever, we can give you a lot more services. And that's what a lot of people get. So I would say that nowadays apps are super professional. They really standardize a lot of stuff. You don't need to reinvent the wheel for apps. It's already done. And I will think they will keep evolving into how to provide better stuff and services for the people. That's why machine learning and stuff is really hitting off now. It's the next mobile apps, I will say machine learning. because. They can really do a lot of stuff that we didn't thought that were possible. Like the fact that you can have your phone and identify labels and stuff. And you, in the past, like you take a picture and it's like, oh, what's the email? And you need to write it down. And now you take a picture, you just copy the email and you send it. How amazing is that? <laughs> or a document, like a document. You take a picture, every single word is translated for you and just, you can then edit and do whatever you do. It's like taking the, what was, a pain already just to take a picture send it to someone write it out again to make it thanks to machine learning and all the stuff a lot of things that were in the past again it were like super hard to do or like super challenging and now makes our life a lot easier for a lot of people so i'll say that will continue going that way it's like how to make life easier for a lot of people help them in a lot of ways more service like maybe not so much like the standard apps but apps will be more like server driven than just compiling the app and stuff. It will, you, you will have this kind of box, like more web-ish kind of thing where the service will provide things for you. They will recommend stuff for you. And they will like, again, having more services that they can improve whatever you want. It's like if you got difficult to read and stuff, they can switch the colors if you're color blind and you don't have to have that feature. You can have the machine learning enabled just to give you all the stuff. If you need to translate something, machine learning can do it now way better. If you need a QR code, now machine learning can identify better than the past. And I don't know, a lot of stuff that is going to happen, but I think it will go more that way. It will no longer be the case of like, yeah, download our app in the app store and play store and that's it. Yeah, I really liked what you said about the calculator app on the phone. And you explain to people that someone actually builds that app and it's a simple enough way to describe to them what you do, which brings me to one of the questions that we ask every time in this podcast, which is uh, how do you explain your job to your parents? So how do you do it? I would say the beginning was really hard. It was like, yeah, I'm coding apps. And they were like, are you in something weird? I was like, no, is the money legit? Yes. Oh, then you're good. It's like, <laughs> it's like, they want to make sure that you're not in something weird at the beginning. Because again, explaining someone 11 years ago what an app was, it was like, but what you do is like, and, and they didn't know. It's like, because they, I think that a lot of people have this idea of installing software in a machine that you always need to be careful because of Windows and stuff, maybe you have a virus and stuff. So they really want to know that you're not into this weird stuff, like installing malware or something like that. And again, if you're caught in a, it's like, mom, 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 I'm just uploaded a animated wallpaper that gives you any money. No, but it gives me a lot of experience and stuff. It's like, <laughs> and it's hard to explain them why that's some important achievement to do the whole process of pushing to the Play Store, the App Store, going through all the approvals to get the animated wallpaper that is not going to give you any money, but it's going to give you a, your resume a little bit better. I think it becomes, it depending on where you come. If you come from um, a big city, San Francisco, New York City, it's so easy to explain to your parents. Like, yeah, mama, I work on tech. 
And they're like, oh, cool. That's what I needed to know. It's like, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, or you're a tech. We need yeah. to, the, big, the big money. <laughs> but if you come to like, in my case, like a really small city from in the middle of the country, where no one works on tech. There is no tech companies. Every single store is a neighbor store owner. So you got the, the groceries, you got clothing, you got furniture. You don't got tech companies. So explaining to them, again, it's coming back again, like the approach of the Hollywood of Silicon Valley. It's like, yes, people can understand that someone is famous and is in Hollywood and makes a lot of money. But do they really understand that? They understand that they make a lot of money. It's like, yeah, they make $80 million. But they don't understand the value of $80 million. They don't understand the value of living on, uh, I don't know, Beverly Hills. They can see it. But they they it's nothing around there that they can match that expectations. So when you say it's like, yeah, I work in Silicon Valley when the office of Apple takes a lot of acres and it's huge. You work in tech and all these technologies. And it's like, but you make money? It's like, they don't understand really. <laughs> so it, it, it is kind of hard. Yeah. They think even when you will say it's like, oh, I work on PayPal. And it says, what you do, you pick up calls and you do administration tasks. It's like, no, no, no. I just add a new features, adding a new button in the app. And they're like, you do that? It's like, they don't, they, they, they don't go the value of doing a new features and software as they maybe do a more, I will say, manual labor. Like if they really need, to, they really know how to, if you build a house, you understand the process of building a house. Like there is a lot of manual value. They put a lot of energy. But when you go to, okay, that amount of value and energy is in your head. Because people say it's like, oh, you, you never use a, a, a shovel in your life. That's why your hands are so soft. That's what sometimes people say here. It's like, yes, but I ended up with a terrible headache at the end of the day because I have to think a lot of algorithms. I have to think a lot of problem solving. And it's so mentally consuming that I would say it's almost the equivalent if I spent the entire day building a house because my brain is like, just relax, relax, because you're going to have a, breakdown right now or you're going to be burned because of thinking so hard about something so complex that maybe not a lot of people did in the past and you need to, when those issues came to you it's like how do you explain to someone who never experienced that thing so it is it's always so hard to explain why you do sometimes it's easier to say i do software the apps that you have in your phone i work in those kind of apps and they pay me money and that's it <laughs> It, it's simpler that way. Don't over explain because I don't think they're, they can comprehend that level of details. Yeah, yeah I think that's easy enough. <laughs> Earlier, uh, when you talked about teaching this group of teenagers and how it helped you become a better manager, I found it really amazing. You know, when these guests come to this podcast and it's about software development, so you wouldn't necessarily expect that they would tell you all these beautiful and inspiring stories, but they do. And that's one of the best parts. So it was really cool. So I also wanted to ask you about what do you think? What's the best way for self-improvement? And what would you recommend to people who are new to mobile development? Nowadays, it, like I say, it's a lot easier. You got a lot of YouTubers providing a lot of information. I would say that even if you take those approach of going into online courses, you name it, Udemy, Udacity, all those websites that it can give you uh, experience in terms of, of how to code, but they would not teach you experience of how to work. Because people say it's like, oh, you're you developers, you are like the, the new stars and all the stuff. Yeah, but my everyday office job is like every office work job is like, Yes, I'm. More, I'm could be more creative. I can do a lot of more stuff, but it's still nine to five. It's still like, I I need to reach my goals. I still need to get low, like submit my hours and get paid and all the stuff. It's no different from any other nine to five office job. So I would say like, even if you start and build your resume, try to go in a, in a company, even if it's not the best payment. You say, oh, I wanted to go to Google. No, start from someone really small, start the process, learn what agile means, mean what um, spring means and all the stuff. Because as soon as you get a company, they will tell you, hey, do you have knowledge in agile? Do you have knowledge in springs? Do you have knowledge in how to handle uh, release candidates and all the stuff? You, you will say no. 
And only that, the soft skills will be the ones who took out of that job. Not the hard skills. You have the hard skills. But the soft skills was the one that is like, yep, they're not suitable for the job. So it's amazing if you had all these hard skills, but please take care of your soft skills. Because sometimes, trust me, maybe the soft skills will be the ones who are going to grant you that job and not the hard skills. Because the hard skills you can learn in. They know that. They know that in, maybe you're not the best on, I don't know, reactive programming. They can teach you. In six months, you will be really good at React programming. But if you don't have those soft skills that they can lead you into be a more principal developer or a tech, or a tech lead, you're not suitable for, the, for that. And also, a lot of the things that I say, because I've been doing, in part of my job, a lot of interviews. I think I've done, like, in the past year and a half, like, 40 interviews. A lot of the things that I say is I rather to spend more time talking in the interview about the soft skills. Because if we spend one or two, three months searching for someone, and then we did the interview and we hire that person and we go like three months until they really figure they, they like or not the company if they, they don't. And if you didn't tackle those soft skills, it didn't realize because it was like, oh, this has amazing hard skills. So we're gonna take it for that. And that person doesn't feel comfortable or no one feels comfortable with this person, you didn't lose those three plus six months because now you need the same again for someone to reach that person level of knowledge. You need those three months again to search someone else, three months to reach the level of the three months that that person have. So you lose a year and a year of budget for hiring someone. That's a lot of money. But if you spend a little bit more, maybe four months finding someone and you has amazing soft skills that's kind of suitable perfect for the job maybe doesn't have all the hard skills that we need but this person is not going to quit for the last two years because it really shows that this person is going to feel amazing in the company and if you hit it you only lose four months not a year and that's it that person is going to overperforms is going to be acting great it's going to feel every day amazing in the company it's not going to leave because of the culture that they match in the culture of the company so they will feel better and even if they left the company after two years kind of pay off all the time that they were working there because they over deliver all those times then someone because you opted for the hard skills and you ended up losing tons of money so that's what i say focus on the soft skills the hard skills will eventually become you cannot fast enough become a senior senior is going to take years no matter what you do even if you're really good and you have this amazing mind that it can drain a lot of information you're not going to be a senior engineer in one year. It could take you three years instead of five. But the soft skills, you can maybe have it right now. Or maybe you can train yourself in two or three months and have those soft skills. But that's going to land you into a better job and even even better payment just because you have all these amazing soft skills. And sometimes soft skills are easy to get if you really know how to do it. Some people are not. They're just, they really are self-driven there's like no i'm gonna make my own company i'm gonna make my own call i don't i don't want to work with someone else okay you do you if that gives you money working alone go your way but if it's a company you need it go with the soft skills they'll they'll grant you those silicon valleys and that will grant you all those stuff yeah that's great advice uh, i believe in this as well it's much easier to improve your hard skills than your soft skills the hard skills you can change it if you do yeah. something wrong you can fix it soft skills when more with someone reaches the 30s and 40s they already have a personality how do you change someone's personality in one month it's really hard a hard skill is super easy it's like you're doing this wrong you needed to do this way okay done fix a soft skill is like hey you, you have this attitude every time an issue happens can you change it and humans don't change that you humans are they get used to behaviors so Behaviors takes a long time to change. Behaviors takes a lot of stuff. Unless there's something really critical that happens in your life that is like a, I don't know, someone passing away or a breakdown or a divorce or something like that, that hits you and that makes you a change in life. But if not, when people are comfortable, they are they. So they're not going to change their soft skills that quick. So it's better to train yourself from younger to get those cool uh, uh, soft skills. And if you're a little bit older, just try to understand how the whole uh, process of a company is how to working with younger people is because sometimes you have managers that are younger than you and you have to deal with that 
And I think especially, uh, so I definitely second uh, your opinion about the importance of soft skills. And I think one soft skill is especially like very valuable is to give and receive feedback because really like feedback shows you the, um, you know, your blind side. So yes. the, all the things that you cannot see and uh, it's such a gift to receive this from someone that so really pointing you all the things where you can learn, but it really takes getting used to and um, practice to like receive yeah. feedback with, and how to handle it and how to work on it because, you know, it's not always easy, uh, not always comfortable but still uh, can be like enormous value. Yes, I think in that case, Silicon Valley did a good job of people receiving, taking and giving feedback because it happens in a company because if you're working with a team, someone pushes a mistake to develop and because of that mistake, everyone loses an hour of their job. You're going to get say to that person, hey, you break development, be careful. I can teach you how to fix this, but please be careful. And because you also wanted to keep the job because if a manager finds out and some stuff and keeps happening, that person's going to get fired. And if he's part of the team, you want to try to help them, but you also want to give this, if you want to call call the feedback to that person say like, Hey, you F this, be careful. Or Hey, you did it again. What's going on? Can we fix it? And having all these, uh, a lot of people now maybe doing remote work, because you can do remote from everywhere, that means you're gonna have sometimes different cultures. So here in South America, sometimes it's a little bit hard to take the feedbacks. Like if someone tells you, hey, you're not communicating enough, or your job's great, but you're not communicating enough, and they sometimes take it personal. It's like, this is not personal, this is strict for the job. If then in the outside, you wanna be more introverts or extroverts, that's on you. But on job, it really improves if you communicate a lot more. You can have, I don't know, your suit character and job when you're a different person and you suit more into the company. So you can improve your work and you're going to feel better. But I will say like, yeah, feedback is amazing and people should accept bad. And of course, the good feedback is always good. But the bad one is take it as a professional advice that someone that is trying to help you to make the better work. It's not trying to grind you because they love to grind you. I don't think no one enjoys that. Uh, unless someone is, then that person is not suitable for the culture of the company. But if someone tells you, hey, you did this mistake, and if you did it again, can I help you? And this is something that maybe you don't know, and you tell us that you knew. Can I help you to fix this? It's like, I can help you with that so you don't go through that mistake again. Because this really could affect everyone. And if you take it as a, wow, someone's trying to help me, I can actually change this. There's a tremendous change in your career and in your mindset as well. You say like, okay, I can take criticism and, and also I can take um, good feedback and don't put into my ego and think that oh, I'm the best developer so I can do whatever I want. That's not the case again. Take the good feedback as humble and say, oh, thank you so much for actually recognizing this. Yeah, it really means a lot. And not to say like, Everyone gets feedback, gets feedback. Oh, I'm the best company, from, developer from the company. It, they can never fire me. And then they fire you. And you don't understand why. Because you just get all the feedback into your ego. So take it middle ground. If you cannot really go really clear, just take a middle ground. It's like, don't affect the bad feedback. Don't take into your head the good feedback. So now we have some great takeaways for the end. That's all the time we had for today, unfortunately. It's been super fun talking to you. Thank you so much again for coming here today. It's a pleasure to meet you all. And thank you so much for having me here. You can follow Mariano on Twitter at GeekMZ or check out his projects on GitHub, for which you'll find a link in the show notes. Thanks everyone for listening and stay tuned for the next episode. Bye.